Thank you. Yeah, so basically the title of our talk is uh, Data Validation with Apache Spark. Um, my name is Patrick Pishonary. This is my colleague, colleague Doug Baylog. Um, we're both employees of Target. Um, give you a little bit of an outline of the things we're going to talk about today. So we'll, we'll introduce ourselves a little bit more, um, give you some motivation for, for why we did this work. Uh, and then Doug is going to present the data validator uh, framework to you in, in some more detail. Uh, we'll talk about work we've done to open source the project uh, and then some future work and conclusions um, about what we've presented. Um, so yeah, so basically my background is in, it was in mechanical engineering. I, I kind of worked at the intersection of high performance computing and um, turbulent and combustion. I kind of used the, the uh, computer skills, technical skills, modeling skills from that and, and transferred over to the data science world about uh, three or four years ago now in, in 2015. Hi, I'm Doug Balog. Uh, I've been a long time Spark user. I used to work at a company called Conviva with which we had uh, Jan Stoika was our CTO and Matei Zaharia and Patrick Wendell were our interns. So uh, I've been a long time user of Spark and um, my, our group in Pittsburgh brought Spark to Target. So a little bit about Target. Uh, obviously it's a, it's a big retail company. You um, probably are all familiar with it, but um, I wanted to bring up some statistics just to kind of get uh, feel for the amount of data that, that we have coming in. Um, so, you know, we have over 1,800 stores in the United States, uh, 39 distribution centers. Um, when you consider all the headquarters and team members worldwide, it gets to be over 300,000. And we have the online business at target.com. Um, the idea is, or, or the thing that's worth appreciating here is that on any given day between the store transactions that are coming in between the online track transactions that are happening, you know, day and night, um, inventory information, distribution information. We have a lot of data coming in and um, anything that you might have checked yesterday might very well have changed, um, you know, it, it, in the next couple of hours. And so that was kind of led to our motivation for doing data validation work. And, and I think the, the the overarching goal that we have is, is maybe extremely simple, but the idea is we just want to understand our data and we want to kind of force the users of our data to have to understand it too before they can even use it. Um, and, and another motivation for this is to catch errors and anomalies early in pipelines. I think you know data scientists in this room, data engineers in this room have probably um, you know, had a pipeline run, uh, it ran for a few hours or, or maybe even longer, you get some error message at the end, you scratch your head, you, you go back and check a bunch of different things and ultimately it was, you know, some stupid problem with your input data. Uh, and so that's a frustrating experience. So the idea is, is to prevent those kind of short circuit workflows to the second those things are detected um, and, and save the compute and save the headache. Um, and so we think these things will kind of help promote best practices for data management. Um, and um, we, we kind of equate this to like hygiene for your data. So maybe nothing that we're going to talk about is too um, fancy or hard to understand, but it is important, kind of like brushing your teeth. Um, one of the things that we really felt strongly about was we wanted something that was easy to adopt. Uh, we wanted something that was language agnostic. People like to program in Python. We like to program in Scala, um, you know, Java. There's any number of languages you can do. Um, but we wanted the interface to basically, basically be something like a text file. So if a product owner, if an analyst, if an engineer, if a scientist, anybody who wants to write a configuration check can do it without having to dig into code and recompile things. And then obviously, um, efficient on large data sets and distributed systems, and this is kind of where Apache Spark comes in on the back end. Um, we want to be able to handle large data sets. We want to be able to, to, to run these checks quickly. Nobody wants to wait for them. 
Uh, and so I wanted to, to call out some of the things that, that uh, kind of inspired us when, when we embarked on this work. And, and the first two references there are, are papers that have come out of Google. Um, obviously, TensorFlow has been talked about a lot here in, in, in the last couple days. Um, TensorFlow Extended, uh, a TensorFlow-based production scale machine learning platform. Uh, that paper came out in 2017. A lot of good insights in there. Uh, just we read it and, and we felt like, yeah, this this is this makes a lot of sense. Uh, and kind of along those lines, uh, hidden technical debt and machine learning was an earlier paper, but uh, talks about some of the th same things with regards to data validation. Um, the third reference there is is kind of a it's kind of a nerdy reference. Uh, it comes out of the collaboration and research and methodology for official statistics from Eurostat. But they've really kind of written a nice little white paper about data validation checks and the different checks you might need to do and the different levels you can have checks, whether they're checks within the same table, ch checks that incorporate multiple columns of the same table, checks that um, you know, or across tables in a database, across databases in a, in a, in a data lake, et cetera. Um, and then we want to acknowledge our, our, our colleague, Anna, who, who gave a talk last year um, about basically doing kind of data validation checks by extending the Spark Scale APIs. Um, we, we've tried to kind of build and honor her work in, in, what we present, in what we're going to present here today. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, Doug. Uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm going to go over the features of the data validator, uh, uh, talk about the, some of the validators we have, and uh, the, the reporting and notification uh, uh, support that we have. And then I'll turn it back over to Patrick to talk about the profiling work he's done to uh, help uh, understand the data. So uh, to start off with, uh, uh, I'll explain the sort, sort of the flow. Um, so the, the data validator first uh, parses the configuration file, then uh, it, it supports simple variables, and, and so it has to resolve the variables in the configuration file and, and then does variable substitution. And then uh, we, we try to uh, exit fail fast and, and detect any configuration errors as soon as we can to, to give it, before we do any real work and waste resources. If we know we're going to fail, we'll fail f fast. And then the, the last part is, is the validation uh, checks themselves. And, and so for each step of the, of the process, uh, we generate uh, these validation events that, and, and at the end of the run, we'll collect up all of the events and, and and generate a report. And uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the report and uh, sh show you uh, some examples. So uh, the configuration, uh, we, we looked at a couple different uh, configuration file formats. We looked at TOML, just plain JSON, and we, we settled on YAML because uh, YAML um, is, is uh, easy to edit. Um, there's support in a lot of editors, and, and with the uh, adoption of Kubernetes, everybody is, is, is familiar with it, and it's a, a familiar syntax. And um, there's, there's some decent libraries in, in Scala that support it. And, and so in our configuration file, we have uh, uh, dif different sections where you can define the variables, and, and you can also define variables on the, on the command line. And, um, so we define variables and then the, the different report settings and, uh, you, you know, so our reporting, we, we support, we can send an email uh, and, and then we also have uh, notification settings, which uh, I'll, I'll get to later, and then the validation checks themselves. Uh, so this is a sample uh, uh, configuration on, on the uh, left and uh, uh, the, and, and, and so we have, this is the variable settings. So we support four different types of, of variables that you can set in the config file. And, and so the, the first is a simple variable substitution where, uh, you know, in the example, we have an environment, we, we want to set a, a variable env, and in our case, it's, it, it's generally prod or stage. 
and uh, you know that's a simple substitution. And then the, the, the next one is uh, an environment variable. We can uh, load a, a variable, set a variable based on an, an environment variable. And, and in this case, uh, we'll set Java dir to be the Java home environment variable. Um, and, the, and the third way is we can take the first line of standard output and, and assign it um, to a variable. So in, in, the, in the example, um, I, I was, I was a little bit lazy in that I didn't want to implement uh, all, 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 a different uh, language to, uh, like a little mini language to support like date syntax, so I just like adopted date from the shell command. And you can do like all kind of different date calculations with date. So, um, and, and this turned out to be a pretty handy feature to be able to run a shell command and take the output in, and then use it later on in a, in a validation. Um, and then the last one is uh, uh, I can run a simple SQL command and then take the results of that, the first row, the first column of the first row, and, and then use that later on. Uh, so the, the next section is, is the report setting. So um, uh, you, we can specify, so this, this, event, uh, this, this event buffer that I, I talked about earlier, um, it's used to, we, we can send this JSON buffer to uh, an output file and, and we can append it to keep track of all the runs. So, so you'll have a, after running for a month, you'll have, you know, once a day, you'll have a file that contains 30 uh, JSON records in this file that you can then uh, go through and write a, you know, have a summary report. And then the other way is, is to uh, uh, pipe the output, pipe this, this uh, JSON report to uh, an external program and, uh, like a like a, a you know a Python you know a, a, another program that you wrote in Python and that Python program can be used to do a couple different things and in our case we take the the events and uh, convert it to InfluxDB and then we'll 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 create a dashboard based on that and and you can also have this program decide whether or not you want to fail this validation or not by either ignoring the error or not so. Um, and, and here I, I talked about um, at the end of the run, we can, we can send an email report to alert people of, of failures or the status of the, of the checks. And this is just a, you, you know, everything, you know, you specify the SMTP host, the subject, the from, the to, whatever, and, and you can specify one or multiple, and we support variable substitution in this too. So you, could, you can assign a variable to who you want to send it to and then have, have that resolved. Um, and, and then uh, here's an example. Uh, my, I learned HTML in the 90s, so that's uh, kind of our default HTML report is, is pretty old school. Uh, so, uh, and then the next section is, is the, uh, the validation checks themselves. So first you specify the, the asset um, that you want to run the checks on. and um, and, and we support Hive tables, org files, Parquet files. Um, we, we can, it's easy to add another source if you have one, but, it, and as uh, part of that, uh, we, we can also support a condition on, uh, on, on, the, on the table. So if you wanna run uh, the checks only on the latest partition of the data, you, you can, or, or today's, um, you, you can add that there, and that will filter the data that you run checks on to, to just that. And then um, you have the checks themselves, which, uh, um, you, you know, in this case, we're gonna, we, we have a, a check on the minimum number of rows on the table and uh, a, a negative check on the age. The age shouldn't be negative, and uh, the occupation column should not be null. So, um, uh, if you want to write your own validator, we, we have a few uh, base, we, we have a few classes that you can extend. And so here's um, a, the abstract, sort of the main abstract base class. And um, you know, if you remember the steps that you follow, so you know, we, we read in the variables, we resolve the variables, and then we go through the checks and we do our variable substitution. So you, you know, to, to the, the first step is to implement a, a method that uh, substitutes all the variables and returns basically a copy of our, ourself. Um, and the next um, 
the next step is to write a uh, configuration check. And, and configuration check isn't as easy as it would seem because in, in the configuration, so we're using YAML and we support, uh, you can, a lot of times like you don't know until you read the, uh, the data source what the source, the type of the column is. So in the configuration you could have an int but the type could be a string and um, you know, there's, there's, in that case that would be fine, but if you have like the, you specify an int, uh, you, you know, where, where the types aren't compatible, then we, uh, that's an error and, and we'll fail, uh, you know, and we, ne we need to return that as quick as possible. So um, the, the next step is uh, we, for each check we implement, uh, we're essentially doing a select and of different columns and so, uh, you need to implement a, a, a method that returns a catalyst expression and then that catalyst expression will get combined with the other ones and, and then we'll hand that to Spark to do the execution of the, uh, of the full query at the end. And then for reporting, um, and, and then the results of that query in, in most cases returns a single row which then you, you need to, like, like, so we need the, the rows return plus the, uh, total number of rows and then the index is, is sort of what position in the row that, that our value is that we need to look at. And, and, uh, and the checks also supports generating a little HTML snippet that gets included in the report and also the, the uh, to JSON which will create a, the JSON representation of this check along with all the events associated with it. So, um, and, and there's, uh, Two, uh, two types of checks that, that we have. Uh, there's, there's the row-based checks where you're looking at the rows in indi each, individual, each individual row in a column. And the other type of check is a column-based check where you're doing an aggregation across all of the rows in a column. So um, this is, uh, this is as, as you can see, the, this is sort of the example of, of if you look at the select, um, we're, we're wrapping, so, so we have a column test where in, in the case of the, say the negative check where uh, we're checking to see if this column is, is uh, less than zero, uh, we'll return that column test expression and then wrap it around an if statement and, and what happens if, if, the, if, if the test is true, it returns one, which means we found an error. If it's false, it returns zero and then we'll wrap this in a sum and, and get the count when we execute the query. At, at the end, um, and and then we we have this is just an example of the column based check where we're doing like the max value of a column, and and so we'll take the max as, as you can see at the the, the bottom we we take uh, this is just a little snippet of the of the expression you can see the max uh, an unresolved attribute of the column just figures out the column and then we create this aggregate expression to to do that, but this is all, so we're using Catalyst and we're building these expressions and we're leaning on Catalyst to do the optimizations um, and make it as efficient as, as Spark can. Um, so I have some, we have some concrete examples and um, we used uh, uh, publicly available data from the, the census income data set and this is just a, a, a sample of the data and here's sort of, uh, you, you'll see the, the sample schema and here's a few examples of, uh, of, of the checks that, that you know, uh, I'll, I'll show you. So um, this, this is, as I talked about the catalyst expression, so th this, this example here creates, um, this, this is sort of the explain of the full expression done. So you can see the, um, the functions, you know, there's a count at the beginning which counts the number of rows. So we, we can, um, that one kind of, that check usually comes for free because we're always counting the number of rows to determine like the, the percentage of how many, what percentage of your data failed the check. And um, uh, so, so you, can, you can see how, how it gets converted. Um, so I talked about reporting. So here's a, uh, the reporting is essentially an event log of what it does. And so in order for my debugging, like I, I log all the configuration settings and then we log the variable substitutions, uh, the runtime environment and statistics, 
um, in case we need them for debugging later when a data scientist says, hey, uh, the, the data validator failed and uh, it wasn't because of me. Um, and then uh, we also include the runtime statistics, such as how long it takes to run a check on a column. And um, it, it's, I, I tried to, you know, storage is cheap, so I tried to include everything that we could possibly think we would, might need later on. And, and so the, um, and, and so what we have here is, is, is for the row count example, this is sort of, uh, um, you can see on the one side, like, uh, w you know, we have a check, it's a row count check, and then on the other side is the, um, sort of the event that gets created for that row count check. So it essentially mirrors the configuration, and then we have a few additional sections. One is the failed. You can see that this count, fa this check failed, and then there's an event, a, a, a check event which failed, and it gave you kind of a, a label on the minimum number of rows. Um, it's sort of descriptive, and the count, the actual count that it was, and um, the error count was, it, in this case, this, this check can only generate one error. Um, and, and then, like, for, for, a, for a negative check, you can see the same thing. So the, the negative check generates this event, and this event, in this case, this, this didn't fail, and, um, you know, there's a label that we can use to, for printing, and, and the number of rows we checked was, was 31,000, uh, you know, around 31,000 rows. Um, and, then, and then here's an example for the, uh, for the, for the null check. So, um, and with uh, that, uh, and, and here's an example of, of the profiling, which I'll hand it back to Patrick to, uh, to, to describe that. Yeah, thank you, Doug. Yeah. So, yeah, one of the things that we, we've been thinking about with kind of the validation is if we're going to go through the data, make a pass through the data to check things, then why don't we use that pass to kind of calculate some statistics or, or metadata, metadata about, about our columns. And, and so um, we kind of wrap this up into an idea of called profiling. And, um, you know, uh, we show uh, on, on your right-hand side, like a, con a sample config, how you would specify the column statistics for a column. And then kind of the uh, event that gets generated. So in this case, it's, it's just very simple statistics. Um, you know, such as the, the count, the min, the mean, and the max. Um, this would be like for the age column, so, so we could see like a minimum age of 17, a maximum age of 90, and what the average age is. And then again, using, you know, the sample data set, we could see, um, we could see the same, same statistics generated for the number of years of education that somebody reported having. And we see, you know, a minimum of one and a maximum of 16. Um, and in fact, we can do really more statistics than this. Um, you know, we can do things like uh, standard deviation, and we can do things like histogram and quantiles. And the, kind of the way to, to, we have a couple of different ways of doing this. One of them is to leverage kind of the cat catalyst aggregate expressions that are already there. Um, the other thing to leverage is this uh, user-defined aggregate function. Um, which is kind of like a MapReduce API. Um, I've, I've included a very shrunk down um, stub here for you, but um, basically it's, it's how, how does, you know, um, each, how is, what buffer does each mapper have to maintain, and then how do you reduce and merge them? So the, one of the things with, with profiling and, and and so kind of like we, we can run these tests, we can look at the results, we can, um, we have this event log that we're populating throughout the entire time. We have this report that we're generating and one of the things that we support is a way to, to pipe the report that you've generated to some additional program that maybe you've written. And so this feature has been used within Target to kind of pipe uh, report information to a metrics dashboard or something like that. Um, one of the things that we've kind of um, shown as a proof of concept is to leverage a tool as, like, such as Facets Overview, which is something that came out of um, Paircode. Uh, and basically, this is a sample here. Um, 
basically you have to convert your output to a protocol buffer format. Uh, and then um, Facets Overview is able to produce kind of these nice visualizations for you um, where you kind of get a nice overview of the, um, of the columns that you have statistics for and you get a quick um, like little histogram there in the corner. And then you can kind of change that drop down menu and, and see a quantile if you like or even actually list values. Um, and so the example here is just numerical features. It also has some, some visualization for um, categorical features as well. Um, so kind of one of our longer term goals is to, is to, is to pipe this up um, to a, uh, like an, a web page where we can go and actually see um, this overview for each of our data sets. Um, so basically, we, we have uh, open sourced this work uh, under an Apache license. Um, that is, you know, you can find us on github.com target data validator. Uh, I will say, as of this morning, the private public switch hadn't been flipped yet, but I promise you it's coming. It, unless it maybe got flipped while we're up here talking, that would be cool. Um, but please, if you're interested, um, check it out at, at some point in time. And, you know, we'd love any ideas and contributions and, and hearing from people. Um, so we have a lot of ideas for future work, and, and I think you know, the obvious one is, is to add more validation checks. You know, we have a handful of them. Um, you can actually do a lot with them, but we can um, dream up any number of, of different uh, types of validators we'd like support for and, and, and kind of keep you know, we showed the validator base and the row based and column based classes and, and how we can extend them to add more checks. Um, one of the, the big things that we want to do, and this was talked about in the, you know, the TensorFlow data validation paper, is we want to leverage the profiling information that we showed to generate kind of default configuration files. Um, you know, in the beginning, we talked about um, Target, how it has a lot of data and, and, and things like that, and you probably don't want to be the person who has to type out the configuration files for all these different data sources. So the idea is to use the profiling information to kind of generate a good start for data validation and then a, a, the data validator config file and then um, you know, the users or product owners or whoever can, can kind of um, adapt these things to their needs. Um, we have some work to do to prepare for you know, the uh, newer versions of Hadoop and, and Spark, um, so that's on our roadmap. Uh, I think ultimately down the line we can start to talk more about just, we can start to add more than just basic validation checks and start to think about things like um, anomaly detection or maybe how, how is a distribution shifting over time, like we have histograms. Um, as data evolves, it, it, it you know, maybe naturally should shift, but Sometimes maybe a shift would be an indication that something is wrong. So, so things like these to support. And then, of course, any, any ideas and um, input that we can get from the community. So you know, just in conclusion, I, 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 I would say that we've had some good success with uh, early adoption within Target. So we've been encouraged by that. Um, and we hope that um, in making it open source, we'll, we'll get to see some more adoption and more ideas from people. Um, you know, I think I won't touch, touch on each of these. We mentioned them earlier, but you know, for the most part, the idea is we want users to understand the data. And we think that by writing, uh, using the data validator, having the da uh, data validation as part of your workflow, whether it be in like an Uzi workflow or an Airflow workflow, writing that configuration file kind of forces the user to think about what, um, they expect from their data before they use it. And every time that pipeline executes, those checks get executed. Um, so with that, I'll finish up. Thank you. I mean, we'll take any questions. I, I'll kind of do the, uh, the shameless plugs, if you will, for Target, which is that we, you know, we are hiring. You can go to jobs.target.com and you could search lead data scientist, lead data engineer. Uh, I have an office nearby in Sunnyvale, headquarters Minneapolis. Um, Doug and I are actually from the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania office, so if anybody really likes Pittsburgh, 
Um, and then I want to just call out our uh, colleague Anna, who's giving a talk in a, in a few hours, um, paralyzing with Apache Spark in unexpected ways. Thank you. Questions? Mm -hmm. right. We um, have nine more minutes if you have I any have questions. Question. I have a question here. Uh, could you please walk up to the mic? Okay. I'll go ahead. Uh, so this was a really great presentation. Um, we do something similar at GoFundMe for data validation. Uh, so my question was, uh, do you guys support only SQL side of validations, or do you have like JSON and S3 kind of support as well? If there is data in S3, do you actually can validate that as well? Uh, do you want to go? I, I don't know what the question. I didn't hear. Oh, uh, we just just support SQL for SQL now. For yeah, now. so we don't have any way of supporting uh, S3 at the moment. Nice, thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Hi, uh, I'm from Capital One. We have a similar tool, uh, but the one of the constraints of the tool that we have, and I, I saw that you have this as one of the to-dos for like a histogram distribution. Uh, so, what's the current work that's been going on to like probably bake in regression testing? So what was the regression sorry. testing like things that change over time right yeah so we haven't given much thought to that yet like to be honest with you we've tried to just try to get the basic checks done and and the configuration stuff done but yeah i think we have to think about okay. yeah I'm, i mean we're, we're trying to get the infrastructure in place start collecting data and then after we have a a, a decent amount of data then go back and look at like to figure figure out what kind of what kind of checks, like you said, we can do. So, um, yeah. The other question I had was about profiling uh, for each column. What are the performance issues you face? Like we've seen with large files, like let's say a 20 gigabyte file or more. Like these jobs take more time than the data pipeline itself. Yeah. So I mean, I think performance. So the one thing is, you know, because because we're using Spark to kind of execute this, so. I think the same kind of performance considerations that you would consider for any Spark job apply. Um, so you know you probably don't want file sizes that are too large. Um, obviously, as if this is part of your Uzi workflow or part of your Airflow workflow, you can tune things like the number of executors, the number of executor cores, the amount of memory, and things like that. Uh, and that's kind of up to an individual's um, you know use case. And the last question, sorry, uh, is like the I checked the repo; it's still I guess private. Ah. Uh, but uh, is it at the back end? Are you using data frame API or data sets? What we're using at the back end? Are you using data frames or data sets? We are using the um, well. I, uh, I mean data frames. Data um, frames. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. This we. I mean, we convert the YAML into uh, callous expressions, and it uses it uses uh, data frames. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Really good to yeah. Hey, I'm wondering, have you guys used this with Spark streaming, validating data as it streams in yet? Yeah. Uh, no, we haven't. But that that is that is on our list of use cases that that we want to do. Okay. So that that's definitely something that we want to do. Thanks. Hi. Um, thanks for the talk. I'm Mark from Shopify. I, I was wondering, so when you set your validation point, what's your philosophy on when it fails three weeks after? Do you block the job? Do you uh, ping someone? Do you let it go but had a flag? So right, right now, um, we, we let a lot of things go by. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're still. Um, so, so we have, uh, I mean, in, internally to target, we have these, these sort of uh, uh, tables, and uh, yeah, r right now we have 80% coverage on those tables, and we, we we look at the email reports, and then we feed the data into uh, 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 InfluxDB, so we have a dashboard to look at. But yeah, at, at this point, we're um, they're not. I mean, I'm confident that we should stop, but uh, some some of the other people in my group are we, we let it go and then go back and investigate. So, and we, we like there's there's things with the negative check like um, we, we can tolerate you know maybe one or two percent errors, but not more. And right now, like I, I don't have a threshold implemented where I can say like you, you know put in the the two percent or, or 
you know, threshold to allow it through. So, but we'd like to see like the Uzi workflow stop and you get an email that says it failed. But, you know, that's, yeah. yeah we're All right, still thanks. So that is, that is also, I mean, that is something that we have configurable. So like when in the configuration file or, or on the command line, you can basically say, you know, fail, fail out if a test fails or let it go if a test fails. Um, and ultimately, you know, It would be overall for the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, you know, one of the things that was talked about in some of the references that we mentioned was, was kind of treating um, data bugs like, or tr treating problems with data like bugs in code. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that we envision is that uh, as these validation checks fail, those actually get registered somewhere as like, a, literally like a bug report and get logged and get acted upon in a proper way. We're not there yet. Um, hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm Nicola, I'm from ThoughtWorks, and I'm currently working on a data set validation on like a terabyte scale. Um, one thing I want to ask you is about your users. Um, what sort of roles do they have? How technical are they? And what is kind of, what is your strategy for adoption um, in that sense for data set validation? Sure. Um, our users are, are basically data scientists and data engineers at the moment. Uh, and they're working on, you know, different um, teams that are working on different products. Uh, our adoption strategy so far has kind of been, um, you know, one, uh, both Doug and myself, we have different projects that we work on outside of this. So to bring data validation to those projects and then to kind of, um, find our allies and kind of encourage them to, to bring data validation to their projects as well. And, and we've, we've done that so far and it's been promising. We've, we've gotten responses like, hey, you know, this helped me uncover something that would have been a, a, a bigger problem before. Uh, and so we're hoping that, you know, it, I guess we're kind of having a, a bit of a grassroots, grassroots approach to it. Um, certainly not something that uh, is being mandated upon anybody. Hi. Um, so I guess the example we saw today are more like the quality check of the data. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering if you guys do any data type validation, you know, validating your data against the expected data type. Against the actual Free, type? Yeah, against the data type. So I guess we saw the example of, you know, census data, and if you assume that, you know, and column is supposed to be integer, but if it is not, your statistics are going to be off. Uh, so I'm wondering if you do any, you know, data type validation post uh, acquisition and pre-ingestion. Uh, right, right now we, we, we don't, but there's, um, but, but, you know, that, that's also on our, our roadmap to, to implement, uh, uh, you know, so, so the problem that we have is like, the, the types in our database don't necessarily always reflect the types of what the things are, you know? So like, like the date, uh, uh, in a lot of tables that we have, the date is a string. And, and so one of the things, you know, one of the checks that we're gonna put in is like, no, this, this string is really a date and we need you to verify it and then we'll make sure that it's not like, uh, you, you know, February 29th or 30th, that kind of thing. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's we we'd like to do that in the future, but we're you know and also do like like we ha we have some complex uh, strings in there where like we'll be a, like to have a regular expression that runs over and if the data doesn't match the regular expression then then fail it out and those checks are are actually li like I, I wanted to focus on like the infrastructure in place and then you know let this out and and y you know. Uh, uh, and even in, inside a target, like as, as part of the group that I'm in, where I, I want everybody to kind of pick their favorite validator that they'd like to implement, and then we'll have a workshop to do that. And you know, like the regular expression check, the date check, the like string length kind of thing, like like the, those kind of simple things. Where the, you, you know, it's it's really easy. You, you know, most of the code that you're going to have to write is like validating the config. You, you know, because that's a that's a real pain. You, you know. Um, uh, so, so yeah, no, it's, it's in the, it's in, we'd, we'd like to do that in the future, so.
Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, we've run out of time. I'm sorry. I'm sure. Um, yeah, it will be, be available, available, available back outside. Of the room and so. you know, they'll be happy to take Thank questions you. offline. Uh, please give a huge round of applause to Patrick and Doug. Thank we'll you. see you at 3.30 p.m.